G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David, and I run a mortgage broking business called Atelier Wealth, where we help property investors start out and scale up their property portfolio. A common asset class that we see that kind of people think is for the more advanced investor is commercial property. However, I'm kind of here to flip that on its head and say, look, there are a lot of our newer or younger investors that are coming in with a keen eye for getting into commercial property and the upside kind of suits them based on their goals as well. And I think they're trying to build wealth, not only through residential, but also through commercial as well. And so what I've done is I've scoured the internet to try and find some really, really good partners. We've had people that have spoken about commercial before, but I think having a different perspective is always very beneficial for our listeners as well. So I do want to kick off by saying this episode is generally in nature and not intended to give advice. So if you do need advice, please seek out a qualified professional. I want to welcome Mish Daniels onto the podcast today from Revolve Commercial. G'day, Mish. How are you doing? Hey, Aaron, lovely to be here. Thanks for Thank joining you for us. Reaching out. Nah, not at all. Thank you very much. And doing some research and seeing what you're about. But I think most importantly, seeing your results and your longevity. I think that's probably a very, very good reflection that you play with a very straight bat, that you're getting great results for your clients. And I really want to kind of get inside your head to go, how have your clients gone on to achieve long-term success through commercial property, which we'll come to in a second. But before we do kick off, uh, I know that you kind of wear a few hats from a business perspective, from a family perspective, from a life journey as well. So as in true tradition, we start with the three Ps, which is a bit about yourself personally, professionally, and your own property journey as well. If you can share with us, please, Mish. Okay, so um, personally, um, South African born, moved here 10 years ago. A wonderful ago. accent. It, just, it gives you away. It doesn't matter how long you've been in Australia, right? It's a <laughs> iconic. Yeah, no matter how, how hard we try and, and disguise it, it's all there. Yeah. And there's, there's enough of us here. Great community. Great community. Yep. Yeah, so I ran manufacturing businesses in South Africa. I had three, three factories and we manufactured under license to Reebok, Nike, Puma, lots of sports bands, big corporate brands as well. Nice. And that was clothing manufacturing, screen printing, and embroidery, the vertical operation. And I realized at a young age that uh, nobody was going to look after me, so I needed to look after myself. So I started investing in real estate. Nice. And I basically built my portfolio on the manufacturing side as well as the real estate. Life happened in South Africa, as most South Africans have been through, and the writing was on the wall. I needed to leave. I had the opportunity to move to Australia, so here I am. I've got two beautiful little blonde girls, happily right. married. They were very young when I made this decision, and I uh, landed up in a wheelchair. I was attacked. My factory was burnt down. I was held up at gunpoint and I just decided I don't want my kids to go through what I'm going through. So I survived it and I just decided I can't do this and I can't bring them up like this. I had the opportunity to move here and I thought, you know what, we're going to do this. So the long and short is when I moved to Australia, I moved with 8% of my wealth because the wow. exchange rate was just, it was diabolical. It was mm -hmm. like 1 to 12. So by the time we arrived here, we, we arrived with 8% of our wealth and it took six years to bring that money through to this country so my back was up against the wall i thought well i can't do manufacturing here what else do i know real estate and i jumped straight in long story short got into commercial it's an area that i know very well had been doing it for 30 odd years in south africa applied the same principles learned the rules and regulations surrounded myself by very good people and built up a portfolio and within about a year Year to year and a half, I was earning more than most people were um, out of their day jobs. Incredible. And they were really out of the commercial property. You know, people were saying to me like, wow, how have you done this? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, simple, really. <laughs> Apply strategies, you know, go in commercial property. And I had re replaced my income and the rest is history. People will ask me how to do it. And I thought, well, I can show you, but I'm going to charge you. Yeah, people get value from what they pay from, right? So you can tell people, yeah. but it's not qualified advice in that sense, really. It's just a conversation. Whereas if someone pays you and engages you, they're going to take what you say on board, right? So Yes, absolutely. And it's years of experience. I mean, it, it has been trials and tribulation. It's been a very interesting journey since I've been here and been doing it. And I'm absolutely passionate about what I do. I am absolutely passionate. I had reached a stage where I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You know, it's like your whole life is starting all over again. Follow your passion, you know, just do what you love doing and the money comes to you naturally anyway. So yeah, it's been an interesting journey and a lovely journey. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, launching uh, Revolve Commercial, I guess that's off the back of what you're saying, some conversations, people going, how did you do it? So I guess that's the, that's the 
We'll start with your business and, and its inception and its growth. And then that's the million dollar question is, how did you do it? Because you said, oh, it's relatively simple. People probably hate that where they go, oh, it's simple for you. Doesn't seem simple for me. Um, you know, when I first launched it, uh, I launched it probably about seven or eight years ago. And we've gone through a couple of uh, brand changes. So mm. I was trading as Mish Daniel Commercial. And then we got to a stage and I met up with somebody who said, you know what, Mish, you really need to clean up your act and make it a professional brand, which we did about two and a half years ago. So we changed it to Revolve Commercial. And I decided I'm going to make a good go of it and bring some really good people in, so strong strong collaboration partners. And, you know, yes, <laughs> this is not an easy game to be in. Commercial real estate is, it's not an easy game. And I guess that's why a lot of people don't go into commercial real mm. estate. I always say buying residential properties, easy peasy. We live in a, a house, everybody buys a house. Yeah. You know, you know what to do there. You've got two areas of due diligence. In commercial, you've got so many different facets of purchasing a commercial property, so many areas of due diligence. You really need to have your P's and Q's and all your T's done. Crossed and, and your eyes dotted to know whether it's a good acquisition or not. You know, and there's so many things that happen on the journey. I could bore you for hours of case studies that we've done where um, we've gone into properties that are the most unbelievable properties. And without having the right knowledge, and I can see, you know, clients come to me afterwards and they say, hey, we bought this incredible property. It was 8% yeah. medical property. And straight away, I look at it and I say, okay, let's just go through it. So what do you want from me? And they say, well, I just want you to check it out and take on, on the management maybe. And I'll have a look at the property and I'll say, but you've paid, your rental is inflated. So it works in balances. Yep. If you're paying high rental, you're going to pay a high price. So they overpaid for the property because the rental was inflated. The leases weren't secured and whammo. They were stuck with a million dollar property that in actual fact was probably worth about seven or 800,000. So it's little nuances, you know. So your due diligence, you've kind of just done that pretty in your own mind. You looked at it going, hang on, this doesn't look right. And that's a trained eye. It's a bit like when we do it buyers agents and like they're like, that property is not going to stack up. You're looking at that deal. That's not going to stack up. Take us through that due diligence brrr, checklist that you've just done in your head to say <laughs> yay or nay. What are you looking at? So you mentioned like the rental, are the leases secured? We look at hundreds of properties and yeah, you're 100% right. It really is a matter of training your eyes. So the first thing you do is have a look at the asset itself. So if you go on to, let's say, a real commercial, yeah. for instance, and you find something you like, you're looking at the pictures. Do you think the asset looks like something that you'd resonate with? You like it. Okay. You, you need to kind of like the property. Next thing I look at is I have a look at the yield. So I'm going to go and I'm going to look for the, the net rental immediately and I'm going to have a look at what is the asking price and I'm going to I'll know more or less what the cap rate is so the capitalization rate in that area let's say if it's Bundaberg for instance mm. I know that Bundaberg should be around about seven percent depending on the type of asset now if we look at an industrial asset we're looking at around about that seven percent if it's retail maybe about 7.5 if it's office I'm going to push that quite a lot higher so I know you know, what I'm looking for straight away. Yeah. I'm going to run those numbers immediately and also know that in that area, depending on the type of asset, that maybe you should be paying maximum 150,000, 150 per square meter, depending on the type of asset. I'm going to work that out and immediately I can tell you that's an over, that's an, it's an inflated rental or it's market rental. Right. And based on that, I'll tell you whether it's the right price. Okay couple of other factors to look into is, is it a lease back? Because the minute you see a lease back, you got to think, well, if somebody's leasing back, what are they doing? They're wanting to uh, draw the equity out of their property to maybe fund a lifestyle, a business, whatever mm. it is. So they're going to want to get as much equity out of that, that property as possible, which means that the, the chances are they're going to inflate their rental. High rental, high price. So you're going to look at all of that, do a quick market research, see if it's um, market related and whammo, keep moving. If not, go back to the agents, negotiate with the agent, say, look, mate, they're charging themselves $50 over rate. Are they willing to come down and then negotiate from there? So I guess it's, yeah, it's the trained eye, the little nuances. Beautiful. And I guess, yeah, something like in this example, and we, we get this sometimes on a resi side, whereas I've bought the property, now I'm looking for a bit of confirmation bias that I've bought the right property, for example, and, and now you're going to kind of retrospect or retrofit a strategy around it. 
So an engagement and a great engagement for you, what does that look like where you can kind of take a client, maybe they've got, give you a scenario, they've got maybe a couple of residential properties and so now they're looking to maybe diversify their portfolio, which means they've got good equity, generally got good borrowing capacity because they've been able to scale up for a few properties as well. And now they're talking about, hey, look, how do I buy my first commercial property? What journey are you taking them on and what kind of questions are you asking to filter out what type of asset class they should be investing in, Mish? Fabulous question. Absolutely amazing question. What I do firstly is I want to know what type of experience they've got and, and what work they work in. So what are they familiar with? Okay. If they have, let's say they're new to investing and they've got two or three residential properties, we want to know where they are and whether they are positive. Okay. If they're positive, I say happy days, then you're good to go straight away. Let's say for argument's sake, it's a doctor. We have a lot of doctors that come through that's look, that they're looking to go to a commercial property. I I would have a sit down meeting with them where we're looking at, at and, and I'd be asking them, what are they comfortable with? Now, everybody says industrial because industrial is the flavor of the year right Correct. now. Correct. <laughs> However, a lot of people don't understand industrial and if they understand the numbers and if they're coming from a numbers background, engineering or something like that, I'll say, great, happy days all day. A doctor type person is not 100% au fait with industrial so I know straight away I'm going to be doing quite a lot of explaining mm. and teaching they're more comfortable in something that they're familiar with so they might want to go into something that is allied medical they would relate to that so we would set that as their maybe their, their first acquisition or we have it scaled in a b and c so their a property would be maybe an allied medical their b property might be something that's light industrial and then the c property would be something other than that retail Nine times out of 10, you find if you're putting the wrong person into the wrong property, not that they're going into the wrong property, it's a matter of understanding how it actually works, you know? Well said, well said. Yeah. So we take them through the journey. If they've got negative property in their residential portfolio, first question is I ask them, what do they intend doing with it? You know, yeah. are they going to keep those properties? Are they try are they waiting until there's market lift? You know, what, where do they want to go? Because I know straight away that is going to affect their lending. Yeah, nice one. So- when clients come on board with us, the two fundamentals that I do is I would introduce them to specialists. One would be in, in funding and the other one would be in asset protection. Make sure that their asset, that their structures are 100%. That's the next question I pretty much had for you, which is quite often it gets to this point, then, you know, then their eyes glaze over and you go, well, how are we purchasing this property? Like what's the, are we go through a self-managed super fund? Are we going to do it through a commercial, or through a trust? And like, I don't know. I thought I was just going to buy a commercial property and <laughs> unit trust. And so that I would say adds, it's a right thing to do it. So it's getting your house in order in the right way mm -hmm. to do it. But often it, it adds just that layer of complexity, which is then adding more people to your team. So you've suddenly got someone like yourself, the buy, you know, a buyer's agent. You've then got quite often a finance person, broker or a commercial banker, for example. And then you've got financial planner and or an accountant as well. So the team then starts to grow and you may throw in the property manager at the, at the tail end, which is then managing your asset. So as we go through the journey, we introduce them to land surveyors, to quantity surveyors, yep. you know, so these are all pieces of the puzzle that, and as you say, the team members, you know, you've mentioned all the legal and financials, mm. but there's, and again, in commercial, the fundamentals are to have a look at the building itself, as well as the leases. So the legals, the financials, everything else that goes with it. So it's a whole journey all the way right through to the end. And then of course, the management, what people don't know is that in commercial, the management is actually one of the most important of acquisition. No. That is where you're going to make or lose. The whether right you, whether tenant. Whether you're adding value or whether you're losing value. Spot on. The right tenant will make or break. Like last thing you want is turnover. Now, some businesses are naturally going to outgrow. I think that's a great success story where you've got businesses that outgrow and they move, they need bigger premises, for example. That's a sign that that business is successful. Whereas others that kind of flounder a little bit and then you got that turnover and that's real estate that then has a reputation for a bit of turnover. Not because the property's bad, but maybe the wrong business went in there and now it gets a little bit of a black mark next to its name from a, a property perspective, right? Yeah, absolutely. Or well, you might have a business in there who's, you know, maybe they're bringing, they've got a successor and they bring somebody else in, a manager, and the manager's not running the business very well. And, and, and you start recognizing that things are really not going the way that they should be. Business is dropping. What happens the minute business is dropping? The first thing they think of is, oh, maybe we can get a rent reduction or a smaller space or something mm. like that. It's really very important to maintain those relationships with tenants. 
Yeah. You know, to find out what's going on, keep them, keep them bubbling, keep them going, finding out where they want to go and what they want to do. Yeah, perfect. Um, I often say, uh, and people that listen hear me say this regularly, is success leaves clues. So someone like <laughs> uh, someone like yourself, where you probably, and I don't need to know the details, but you've been around for some time, which means that equals some type of success that you've achieved in your own portfolio. No. What would you attribute your success factors to be, do you think, Mish? One word, tenacity. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm the bulldog that doesn't let go. <laughs> so take me through it. Like what's a real life example of, I guess, your tenacity that comes out and having built your portfolio? Look, in our game, I always say this is a real mugs game because we're out there and we are we go out to battle for our clients. And if you think about it at the moment, the statistics are that you've got 58% more buyers in the market than what you have properties. Okay, so you've got fifty-eight percent more buyers that are effectively looking at the same property that you're looking at. And if you're not, you're not quick, you're not fast, you're not on the draw. You might lose that property. And what happens is a lot of people that are maybe not unexperienced purchasers might go into the property. They don't know how to do the due diligence properly, and that deal might fall over. So what I always do is, if I really like a deal, we'll go in, we'll make a reasonable offer. If we don't get the property, I'll go back to it and I'll go back to it and I'll go back to it until I know that the contract is until it's been settled. And often what's happened is we've had a lot of wins by just going back to that same property, pulling it back up, speaking to the agent and being tenacious with the deal, you know, being tenacious with the with the agent. Love it. And the agents really like that as well because they know that you're serious about the deal, you're serious about your offer. Yep. Um, and they know that if that deal does fall over, well, who are they going to think of? Spot on. You know, they're going to come straight back to you. Spot on. And we, this has come up consistently, Mish, when I speak to a lot of, say, buyers agents, agents, real estate agents, the buyer that shows that level of tenacity, the one that stands out in the crowd, that one that won't take no for an answer, the one that keeps pushing and putting themselves at the top of the queue, they are the successful buyer or bidder, for example. And I think quite often people just get that no, that initial re rejection, it hurts, it stings, dents their confidence, and they go, well, I missed out. And it's like, well, hang on, you haven't missed out because no one's signed the dotted line yet. Keep pushing till you get that response. And that's probably what separates the good from the great in any industry and in life in general, I'm assuming yeah, as well. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the one thing somebody was asking me about, when it, what's one of the biggest pain points? And I always say, well, I've learned to love rejection because we get rejected every day. That's exactly <laughs> you know, it. We don't take it personally. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. No. Well said. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What are some of the traps that you see that maybe people that started out strong faltered a little bit in terms of like, I guess we'll call it tenacity and could have, or they had the means, they had the income, they had the opportunity, they've got the equity, for example, but they just didn't hit their, they didn't hit their straps. They didn't hit their full potential, for example. What do you feel brought them unstuck? Was it the wrong tenant that then just left them a little bit jaded or was it some cost that blew out and now they lost a bit of you know faith in the process, for example. What happens to some people there? I think it, there, there's, there are two answers for that question. The one is that um, it's ill-informed, so lack of education, yep. where, they, where they're going into a deal and, um, and it's all sweet and fine and fabulous for a year or two and then things start hitting a wobble as they do and uh, the tenant wants to move out and... As a result of lack of education, not knowing how to deal with that, not having the right agents on their side, they now want to sell the property. Yeah, okay. You know, so so that's a big no-no. Absolutely not. You know, and, and again, that's where tenacity comes in. You say, well, what do you do with lemons? You know, let's turn it into something. Spot on. Yeah. You know, make it uh, – just don't take it personally. Have a look at the lease. Put it back on the market get it rented out, you know, you might take a little bit of a hit on your, on your rental. You might have to come down on your, on your rental, um, which is quite normal because, because the commercial market runs in cycles mm. because you've got that incremental increase that grows up at the top of the cycle, you're going to come down. Mm. You know, if you do the rent review or new tenant, yeah. you start the wheels all over again, but don't let the property go. Yeah. Nice one. Well said. Well said. And I guess financing is another one where people, again, goalposts may move from a finance perspective as well, but I'd say seeing what a lot of the banks are doing, I'd say they've become pro 
commercial. Like banks are so much more open to commercial finance these days that the amount of commercial products that we see come out, 30-year loan terms, for example, not the reviews that were previously done in the past. I'm like, residential lending may tighten up. And this is where I probably see that prevalence now of more commercial uh, interest is going, hang on, the banks are quite pro-commercial for the right client and the right property. And some of the loan products are reflective of that, that kind of innovation in this space as well. Mm. Aaron, I'm, I'm having a giggle to myself because I'm thinking to myself, what's taking them so long? <laughs> <laughs> right. Like you probably got the first mover advantage, like being having bought commercial in the past, whereas now it kind of it's like they've opened the floodgates a little bit more. So you've probably yeah. seen that. But that, yeah. I think people associated buying commercials, I'm self-employed, therefore I'll buy my premises and that's what commercial was, whereas now it's become a true asset class in its own. And the banks are enabling investors to get in as well. Yeah, they are. And uh, I mean, you can speak about this more than I can with regards to uh, the fabulous pro products that a couple of the lenders have brought out. As you say, 30 years um, on commercial yeah. is just unheard of. Yeah. And what that means is that your interest, well, your interest rate's the same, but your repayments are lower. Yeah. So I'll leave that for you to, to explain a little bit more to the audience. Um, <laughs> I, I normally would. However, Bernadette does all our commercial lending. And, and, and again, <laughs> so I'm going to steal Bernie's thunder as I probably do a fair bit. Uh, but having seen uh, you know, Bernadette do self-managed super funds, self-employed lending, but mainly commercial as well, there's yeah. such a specialist skill set that comes with being commercially accredited for one. Like you've got to get accredited by lenders to, be, to do commercial, mm -hmm. but also the knowledge like home lending, residential lending, if it's policy, it's like tick, 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 bank will approve it. Commercial yep. lending, it's like there is no black and white policy. It's like here's the property, here's what the clients are looking to do. Maybe we could try to fit it this way. Maybe we've got another product here. And I can say that because we've recently just acquired a commercial property. And initially it started with a no. And then it became a maybe. Then we presented it's like it's a firm yes. And I was like imagine we took that no at the very beginning and we just kind of packed up shop and went, you know, didn't 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 engage and again it speaks about tenacity but it's like that's what a tenacious broker in the commercial side will do is like no mate they say no we'll keep going we'll keep going we'll keep going to find that if that's what you want i'm so pleased that you're speaking about that um because at the moment that's exactly what's happening in the market and the clients are kind of stepping back and saying oh well uh, you know they've said no and I know that there's that there's so many different ways of lending. Yep. You know, um, so we just go back and we say, well, find another lender, or find another strategy, or find a, a, a second tier lender. Mm. We use dynamic strategy for helping our clients to get into a property. I'll give you an example. We've got a, a client at the moment. Um, they are medical professionals, um, and they're going to be specialising. So they're doing their final years of specialising. So they're not earning specialising uh, specialist rates just yet. Yeah. But any lender that has a look at them should be sitting up and saying, oh, we want them as a, as a client because come next year, they're going to be earning specialist rates. So they're a little bit ahead of their time. We've got them into the most incredible asset and we've had, we've had quite a, um, let's say, <laughs> a rocky road <laughs> at getting their at getting their finance yeah um, but it's this tenacity of never giving up of going back working with working with the right people and saying mate just squeeze it again run it again take it somewhere else long story short we've managed to get them 100 percent loan beautiful on a property and um with one of the first tier lenders who can see that there's longevity in this mm. so they are super super excited it's their first commercial property um, and it's, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a triumph. Correct. And just on that point, you skipped over it, the hundred percent finance, I'm like, that's what's available for like, think about resi. It's like, oh, you need 10%, 20% sometimes commercial. Sometimes you do need more, but other times, depending on what industry you're in or depending on what occupation or what type of property you're buying, there's a hundred percent finance given by that. And you're like, mate, here is an opportunity of a lifetime to get in and, just like residential many, many years ago was you could get in at 100% finance. I remember when I started broking, you could buy an investment property, 105% finance, and wow. it was nuts. And now you couldn't dream of that, for example, and the stress testing they're putting on that. 
Whereas commercial, yeah. they're, they're opening the door. It's like, hey, mate, grab this while you can with both hands because some of these policies may not be around. There's more, more that kind of market gets saturated. The more the banks get exposure, then they'll start to know where their sweet spot is and maybe tighten up some policies, which when you follow the pattern of the banks, that's what typically happens as well. Absolutely. And I mean, for, for, for those people out there that, that are sitting on the fence and, and wondering, you know, it's, I always say, if you don't stick your water in, if you don't stick your feet in the water, how are you ever going to learn to swim? You know, yeah. reach out, find out. We have a lot of clients that come through to us that, um, yeah, they, they check it out. And if it's a no, it's a no. And mm. I'll tell you straight away, you know, uh, up, we can have a look at, at their situation there. Uh, we, we invite our clients to, to go down a little bit of a path so that we can check them out straight away. And um, we'll tell you whether you qualify for a commercial property or not, you know, Beautiful. so um, fairly easily. Um, and the, the, the bottom line is the first question is how much equity do you have? Yeah. Okay. So we always take the worst case scenario. Um, so um, let's say 60% LVR. So if you've got 400,000, you can jump into a million dollar property and it only gets better from there, you know, mm -hmm. because... Again, if you're a, if you're in the medical profession and you qualify for an eighty percent loan or a ninety percent loan, happy days. Mm -hmm. You've just landed yourself in a in a budget of one point two, one point three million. Mm, well said. Yeah. Well said. So, but looking looking at your journey uh, and especially working with clients, what do you think's kind of a standout property and acquisition or one of your most successful um, purchases to date? Do you think, Mish? <laughs> uh, well. Um, probably through COVID, yeah, that we were we were the busiest that we've ever been through COVID. Um, <clears throat> and towards the end of 2019, we were negotiating quite a lot of um, uh, deals. One of them in particular was a shopping centre that was on the market for around about three million. It was just sub three million. I think it was about 2.8 million. Yeah. Um, and the vendor was really just holding on to that price and holding on to that price. And I could see that the, the, uh, we did a, a lot of work on the property. I could see that, um, the tenants were, the tenants were frazzled. They weren't getting the attention that they wanted. Pretty good tenants as well. It was about seven tenants if I remember co correctly. And I saw an opportunity there. So I just let it ride. And as COVID came in, as the lockdowns came in, the vendor was getting more and more anxious because she didn't know what to do. She didn't know how to treat the tenants. She didn't know how to have that communication. Um, and the tenants were, were, you know, not paying rentals. And mm. it was a little bit of a schmuzzle. And we went back in and we offered her, um, I think it was about 2.5, and she turned it down, flat turned it down. So this was over a period of a couple of months. We let it run for a while, and eventually <clears> – <throat> We went back to her with a ridiculous offer at uh, about 1.95, which obviously she turned down. Yeah. And she, we finally settled on that property at 2,075,000. Wow. By that stage, half of the tenants weren't paying all their rental. They were paying part of the rental. There was no communication. There was, there was nothing, you know, between the agent and the, and the tenants. They didn't know where they, they were, and she just said, hey, get me out of here. So it was a little bit of a, you know. A, <laughs> a war by attrition, a, a, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we kind of helped her out there. Yeah. Um, and we went in. We worked that property up. Um, we did refinance within about uh, 13 months, and um, that property refinanced at $3.3 Incredible. Yeah. So, look, that was circumstantial. Yes. You know. Yeah. <laughs> And and I always say, just remember in commercial, you can do something that you cannot do in residential. And that is you can make you can make seventeen dollars out of every one dollar that you're getting in on rental in commercial. Explain that a little bit more if you if you, people have just heard that going, tell me more. Did that, did that, just, did that just miss you completely? <laughs> tell me more. I mean, obviously the revalue and 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 then you got cash flow, but yeah, take us through how you how you've broken that down. Yeah. So on your rental, obviously, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the strength of the value of your property is directly linked to your rental. So for every one dollar that you're adding to your rental at a seven percent yield, you're getting seventeen dollars in value. Do the yield calculation on one dollar. You're effectively adding seventeen percent to the value of your property. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that's why in commercial we say value add. Go mm. for as many value add strategies as possible. Rent out extra spaces. Put car parks in. You know, add as much space. Bring in as as many tenants as possible because mm. that's where your value is is lifting your rental yeah. and that inadvertently re- lifts your value of your property. Nice one. Yeah, well said. There's a great Fun game. movie. Now you know why I'm passionate about it. I agree. There's a wonderful <laughs> movie. I'm not sure if you've seen it. I think it's on Amazon called The Banker. Have, have you seen that one? Maybe a long, is it an old movie? No, it's not too bad. It's got Samuel L. Jackson, a couple of guys in it. The story is African American, two African American guys gone and like build this amazing portfolio. I'm talking like I think the 60s or 70s, for example. And obviously they couldn't transact. So they had to get a, a white American to do all the buying on their behalf because they couldn't do it. They bought like all the commercial property in downtown LA. It's amazing. They they amassed the biggest property portfolio in America through commercial. Wow. Incredible this story. Is a true story? True story, true story. Oh, wow. And then just like how they got, yeah, their journey. Keep going. I'm going to go looking up that movie. <laughs> I, I 100%. If you want to get the, the commercial property bug, you want to be bitten by it, watch that movie. Bernadette and I watched that a few weeks ago. Like we rewatched it. Just going, this is an amazing well, story of, again, tenacity. There were laws there, obviously, that prohibited them from buying property. That didn't stop them. They found a way. They ended up buying a bank. They ended up buying multiple banks as well. So, I mean, that's kind of like it's about betting against the house. But, yeah, just an incredible story and really around that commercial property side as well. So thought I'd just throw that in there for you. Yeah, that's fabulous. I'm definitely going to go and look that one up. Although, yeah. I, and, you know, I'm a commercial animal. I can't stop <laughs> myself. <laughs> I, I'm a psychic. So every time I go riding, I look around and I'm always looking at the commercial. And I think, oh, opportunity, oh, opportunity. Opportunities <laughs> everywhere, Mish. It's, uh, it's, well, and I think it probably gets to that stage probably in, in business life, in your life as well. It's like it's not about saying yes to every opportunity now. It's like what you say. It's not paying that dumb tax. So it's what you say no to that becomes Correct. equally as important as what you say yes to as 100%. well. 100%. Yeah. 100%. I mean, we probably look at 100 properties a week easily, if not more. Yeah. And out of those properties, we maybe select one, maybe two, you know. So we are saying no to hundreds of properties on a monthly basis. Mm. And we're being very selective about the ones that we are saying yes to. Well said. Yeah. And I guess for someone online, they can convince themselves. They can go, oh, yeah, I I think I can make this work. And that 98% rejection rate that you've got, Maybe someone else doesn't have the same level of due diligence, experience, relationships, network that, you know, this is why yeah. this deal doesn't stack up for us, but someone else less initiated may go yes to it and, and then have this, I guess, those headwinds that probably knock out that confidence, whereas you've avoided that. Yeah. yeah. I guess it's like anything, you know, the more you do it, the more the more experience you become in it. It's like playing basketball. The more, the more balls you throw, Spot the on. more you're going to get in the hoop. So, yeah. you know, and you get to know what works and where to bounce and, and, you know, that sort of thing. So I kind of feel as if it's the same for us. We do this fairly easily now. Mm. So for a novice, it's, um, you know, it's quite difficult. Yeah. And the best part is working with my clients, holding their hands and seeing them go, wow, the excitement at the end of the day. Hey, congratulations. Well done, Mish. Really appreciate it. I'm super happy because you've got your own podcast as well. So we're going to share a link to your <laughs> podcast. And this is it, right? If you want to delve deeper, if you want to educate yourself in commercial property, do the hours, put the effort in, roll your sleeves up, put those headphones on and start absorbing as much content as you can so you can then start to make confident property decisions, which is what we're all about here. So Mish, I want to say thank you very much for your time. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, your journey as well. I really appreciate it. We're going to put the links to your business details. If someone wants to do reach out to you, by all means, please feel free to connect. And we don't have any commercial agreements with anyone that we feature on the show. So to, just to keep that above board as well. So Mish, I want to say thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Aaron, it's been fabulous chatting to you. Ah, thank, thank you for the time. Likewise. Wonderful. Wonderful. If you would love to leave us a review, if you found this helpful, please do so. If you've got questions for myself or Mish, for example, or you want to speak to Bernadette from a funding perspective, please feel free to reach out to us. And until next time, that's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Mm-hmm.